Okay, so welcome to the second lecture of Introductory Biostatistics and Bioinformatics. Um, last, this is the second time we've given the course. Last year we made this Learn Python a on-your-own exercise, and we inundated the teaching assistants with a lot of stressed out students. So this year we decided to make it explicit and we're actually covering Python basics in four lectures. So quite a bit more uh, simplification. And I'm giving the first three um, specifically because I'm not a very good Python programmer. I'm new to Python a year ago and so I'm very familiar with what you need to know to learn how to use the language to do practical things in bioinformatics. Um, you need to learn this because the, we're going to come back to it throughout the course and with a little luck throughout your careers. So we're going to try and go slow and make sure that you get it. Already did that. Um, try and make sure that you, you get it. Um, all right, so we have the course website. You've probably all been there. This uh, FENULAB introduction to biostatistics and bioinformatics. Um, we've been successful, I think, in loading the video. David? Yes. Yes, so that was last lecture. So we'll try and keep that up every lecture, get it up within a, a day or so, not immediately after. There's a certain amount of encoding and uploading that has to happen. Um, the slides, yes, and the homeworks are here. Um, all right, I'll get to the, to the homework for today in a little bit, and I'm just going to dive right into the, the Python lecture now. So this is part one of a four-part series just on, on using Python, but specifically with an uh, orientation towards bioinformatics, which is a little different than what you would learn in a computer science course. So Today, we're going to cover this, and it seems like a lot, but it's actually not. It's like 25 slides. So if you have already installed Python on your computer, then good, you're ahead of the game, although if you haven't done it the way we suggest, then you may want to do that as well, because there's Python's kind of a, a modular language, and we're going to make use extensively of the scientific modules, and the way we suggest you install reduces the amount of pain. We're going to have teaching assistance available for you in about an hour and then after class in the uh, TRB building where we have t uh, tutorial sessions. So everyone's going to get through objective one for sure today. Um, in addition, I think my lecture is very clear and simple, so you should be able to understand data, variables, strings, string methods, lists, list methods, slicing, and probably arrays as well. And, and it's actually not a lot because Python makes these things pretty simple. Okay, so I added this intro because you're probably, or some of you may be asking yourselves this question, I'm a biologist, why do I need to learn computer programming? That's not really what I signed up for. And so I give you these two articles. One's an essay. It's, it's technically about Perl, but um, it applies to programming and biology. And at the time this was written, Perl was the um, absolute most common language for bioinformatics. Python has gained in popularity since then. And then this is a, a, a conversation, really, with a bunch of the most famous uh, creators of important software in computational biology, bioinformatics, that was published in Nature. It's not like a journal article, it's really just a, like a chat forum that was held with these people. But each one of them gives their opinions and you can start to see um, commonalities and also um, the eccentricities of every different piece of software and its history. as described by the person most responsible for writing that software. So read this, it'll be a lot of fun, it'll only take you half an hour. The other one will probably only take you 10 minutes, so it's not a big reading assignment. Um, just in general, we've said this before, biology is becoming a data-driven field. We collect lots of data in semi-automated fashion. Analysis of your data is challenging. 
Automation saves time, and software is mostly about automation. In general, you need to know how to do a given piece of math in order to teach or write a program with software that will do that piece of math, even if it's you know, comparing the outputs of lists from different software, et cetera. Anything that you're going to do more than a couple of times or at large scale will benefit from automation. Um, in addition, it, it leads to reproducible science. If you do all your math on the back of an envelope, it's hard to show months or years later exactly what you did and reproduce it exactly. Whereas if you wrote a program and, and saved your program somewhere reasonable, like a GitHub, then it's easy to show exactly what you've done. Um, I may try and point this out to you, but Computational biology is really a very big, very open-ended field. We're producing these data sets and there's lots of unanswered questions in the data that's being dumped into the public. A lot of uh, investigators are funded simply to produce data and their funding is contingent on making that data public on a very short time scale. But within a few months of data production, it has to be made publicly available. So if you have the tools, the skills, to, to crunch that data, you can find new things and get interesting science done simply with your data analysis skill. And again, that's uh, pretty dependent on your ability to work with data and write, write programs. And integrating your own new results with public data, again, challenging and dependent on your data skills. So we're trying to teach you a toolkit of skills that will be useful in your careers. Um, this is my point. Scientists who can pursue innovative data, data analysis methods have a, an advantage, a competitive advantage in a field that is often competitive over those with limited skills or who are only able to use available software or those who require the assistance of someone who knows how to program. If you can take an idea that's in your head and create it, in software, then you can work faster than those who can't build an innovative method or have to communicate that method in a trial and error fashion with someone else who knows how to do coding. So it, it gives you a competitive advantage in a, in a world that's actually pretty competitive, which is you know analyzing data, getting the being the first to make a new discovery, and, and you know we're all about that. So if we have to learn some data analysis skills and some programming, why do we choose Python? Python is a programming language, and in my opinion, all programming languages are fundamentally the same. So we had to pick one so that you can develop a set of skills and we can teach you the peculiarities of this one language. Advantages of Python, it's free and open source. So you can all get it right now on your computer and if you write any code in Python, you can share it with anyone else, and they can run it for free on their computer, whatever sort of computer it is. Um, runs on all types of computers. In the world of computing languages, Python is, quote, user-friendly and easy to learn. Um, the code is English-like and more readable than some other popular languages, such as Java and Perl. And in the last few years, it has become very popular among bioinformaticians. There's a lot of enthusiasm out there for Python. The Python chat rooms are busier than for other languages in the area of bioinformatics. And frankly, it's also widely used at Google, Facebook, and places like that that have some data as well. Um, there's pretty good documentation freely available on the web. Um, Beginner's Guide to Python, I have a link here. You could read that. Um, I have some other reference material for you in a couple of slides. Um, Python has powerful object-oriented features, and what that means basically is it's relatively easy to roll out complex software because you can build on what other people have already done. I spent last lecture talking about bioinformatics data types. So once someone goes to the trouble of writing a Python module that can read a FASTA format or a BED formatted file, that becomes an object that everyone else can use inside of their software and you don't have to recreate that wheel. So 
object-oriented is, is very helpful, and most, quote, modern languages uh, take an object-oriented approach. Um, yeah? No, object-oriented is a way the program is structured. Basically, you can define a data type in the program, and that becomes an object, and then other commands can act on that object, and they'll know where data is located inside of that object. There'll be plenty of examples coming up, and yeah, you will definitely need to understand that by the mid-level of this course when you're starting to use Python to do some complex data visualizations. But for example, an, an example of an object is an array. An array is like a grid of numbers, and it has rows and columns. And you don't want to have to define what's an array every time you want to work with a spreadsheet. You want Python to have an array as a data object. And that object has certain properties, like the rows and columns contain numbers. That's an array. So those are features. And there may be already existing tools features, functions that are designed to work on an array. And so you could just type, you know, cross product. And it knows how to multiply two arrays using the rules of cross product. And so you don't have to write that for yourself either. So that's an example of object oriented. Another feature of Python which is helpful is that it's built in modules. So when you download the standard vanilla Python, you get just this base of software that knows a few functions, has a little bit of a user interface, but it's not an enormous piece of software. Instead, each module, there's module for statistics, data visualization, bioinformatics, image processing, um, language, you know, machine learning of language processing. There's actually lots and lots of modules, hundreds, probably thousands, maybe many thousands. And so the tools that you need, you can very quickly grab and install uh, as modules. So that's just a fact. And you'll try and learn that. So um, XKCD thinks Python is cool and uh, useful for people involved in sort of data science as a career. So I'll just leave it at that. And like I said, you can get Python, download Python, uh, read the documentation at this python.org website. But we have an alternate plan for you to download a, a more complete version of Python that has many of the modules that we're going to use already pre-installed. So I'll get to that in a second. Um, there are a lot of online tutorials for Python, so if you're not getting it, just with what I give you, which is you know, perfectly fine. D different people learn in different ways. Try out any of these resources. I think all of these are free. Um, actually, our four-session tutorial is loosely based on the software carpentry model. They, they would do it over one intensive weekend. So. Um, there's videos of their lectures freely available and some data sets and tutorials as well. So any of these will work. The Python for Biologists is a book. It's actually an e-book that is the reading assignment for the next two weeks. So I, it's the reading assignment. So it's not just recommended. You, 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 should, you should get through it. It's pretty easy and it's very different than most programming books in the sense that they're focused very tightly on what biologists need to know, which means starting to work with strings of text right away rather than as an afterthought, you know, after you've done a lot of complex bubble sort algorithms and that sort of thing, if you were to take a standard course in C or that sort of thing. And a lot of the Python books are written from a computer science perspective because obviously it's, it's a computer programming language. So I really like this book. It's pretty simple and it's not terribly long. So I do that. In addition, I have a, an assignment for you. I, and this is a learn by doing type of an assignment. I should have uh, added a picture because they have a pretty homepage. But there's a online bioinformatics learning environment 
called Rosalind. It's rosalind.info, not .com or org or edu or something like that. Rosalind.info. And they take a problem-oriented learning approach. And they have a Python section, I think it's called Python Village, with just six problems. And those six problems are your assignment for this lecture and next lecture. And you can get through it in one to two hours with relatively little Python experience once you get going. And again, we have the tutors scheduled for, to be available to you today you know, for kind of as long as you need them to get you know, Python installed and the first couple of the Rosalind problems done. So once you finish those six problems, then you're like officially a Python novice. It has a pretty gentle learning curve where you, know, you can learn a little bit at a time and make reasonable use of what you know and then add on additional bits of knowledge as needed to deal with specific types of problems. So, so I'm, I'm assigning the first three chapters of Python for Biologists. Also this really cute little article, the discussion among these um, computational biologists, really famous ones, about what makes good software. So your other assignment, obviously it's sort of a necessary prelude to doing the Rosalind problems, is to get Python installed on your computer. And we recommend the installer called Anaconda which is like a simple download and install and does not require the developer tools or any other sort of compiler. Um, and this is the URL that links to it. It contains already the NumPy and SciPy modules, which we'll be using a little later in the course to do math and visualization. Um, if you want to be hardcore, you can run command line Python on your Macintosh terminal, but you will need to install these modules yourself, which means that you also need the Xcode tools on your Mac. Similarly, if you want to be hardcore, you could run um, some Linux emulator on Windows and install Python yourself. Um, the TAs would recommend you use the Anaconda and get hardcore after the course rather than struggle with uh, software installation challenges instead of struggling with the, the problems that we're interested in. So this is a, the Anaconda website. You do the Windows. If you come in on a Mac, I think it recognizes and gives you a Mac installer. Um, it has numer numerical, scientific, statistical, and graphical modules already installed. And it also has a somewhat graphical user interface, uh, which makes things a little easier. So you can write your code in one screen, hit a button, and see the results of that code in another window or another part of the screen. So that's pretty handy. OK, so that's it for install Python. We'll get back to that in an hour or so for those who need some help. Uh, I said this, that all programming languages are basically the same, and they're the same in this sense. They're built from the same elements. They have data, they have operators, and they have flow control. In the category of data, I would also include variables, a way to store data and point to it and organize it so they have data types like objects. Um, in terms of operators, by that I'm, I'm thinking about math and more complex functions, you know, square root or dot product or something like that. Um, and then flow control is basically the logic of operations, right? So computer program does this and then it does that and then you give it an if, right? And it has to make a decision and the flow goes left or it goes right depending on that, the result of that if. And then you can have a loop, right? So it repeats a certain function a certain number of times while something is incrementing until it reaches the end of that loop and then it does something. So you have, and then you can have, those elements can nest within each other, right? You can have an if inside of a loop or a loop and different parts of an if branching. That's flow control. And so given those three elements, you have a programming language. Every programming language has its own idiosyncrasies. We usually call that syntax. 
meaning in order to, to talk to this programming language, you have to write your commands just so. Python syntax is easier than most, but it's far from perfect. It has its annoying little peculiarities, which we will touch on from time to time. So there it is. You know, you shrug your shoulders and you say, oh, well, that's the way they wrote it. Why can't there be a perfect computer language that has no weirdness in it? And, you know, maybe in the ultimate level of time that will happen. But Python has its own specific syntax by which you express these concepts, data, operators, and flow control. So we have data types. I talked about file types last week, and I said software defines its data much more rigorously. So in Python, we have several types of data, such as a string, which is what we might ordinarily call text. Always in Python, when you're dealing with a string, it's inside of quotes. Python is friendly. It doesn't care whether you use double quotes or single quotes, but you can't mix and match. If you start a quote with a single quote, you got to end it with a single quote. That turns out to be handy because then you can put a double quote inside of a single quote and it will be treated as a literal. It'll be treated as text character rather than something that ends the quote. So you can have apostrophes and stuff like that inside of your text without ruining the text itself. There's numbers. Um, there are integers. There's decimals. There's exponentials. There's all kinds of real numbers. And we'll show you how to represent those as, as the need arises. Um, Python's very friendly about how it stores its data. You don't have to predefine what kind of a number you're going to use or whether a variable is going to hold a string or a number. Um, another kind of value is a true or false, which is a Boolean. And it's not the text of the word true or false. It's a true or a false. And it could be represented in different ways. But it's, it's helpful to think about it as a data type in and of itself. All right, we said object oriented. Well, every object has a type. You can define as many types as you want. Many modules that you load into Python come with definitions of many data types, such as a GenBank file. That has a data type. A FASTA file has a data type, et cetera, et cetera. So strings have many data types. You could have a, um, a DNA sequence string that has a data type. There's actually like six or eight different alphabets that can be assigned to a DNA string, whether you're going to allow n characters, ambiguity characters, et cetera, et cetera. So try these examples on your own. Well, if you've already got Python running and you've got it up on your laptop, you can do this. Otherwise, take out this lecture tonight after you're installed and go through this on your own. Because it's, you learn way more by doing than you do by listening. In software, it's like you know 90-10, doing versus listening. Um, so when you ask type, type is a function in this world. And so you're asking the type of the number one. You're asking the type of a string inside of quotes. And it'll tell you this is an integer and this is a string. And, and you get used to that back and forth between yourself and the program. OK, variable, super important concept. A variable is a named container for data. You can put whatever you want inside of that container. It does not have a fixed size or shape or type. Python is easy that way. Um, you can think of it as a box or a shelf where you can put something. Also, Python, so Python can, variable can hold any type of data. It does not need to be predefined. Many other software languages, you predefine all your variables at the start of the program. In Python, you define a variable when you need it. Occasionally, you need to define a variable a little bit before you use it. For example, inside of a loop, it doesn't like you to create new variables. It likes that variable to already exist before the loop starts. But that's a small concession to make. Also, this is unusual for software. 
the type of data inside of a variable be, can be changed at any time. So you could have a text string in a variable, and then suddenly you write an integer into that same variable. It replaces what was there before, and there's no error. Presumably, you know, if you're going to be doing some math, you want the variable to contain a number. And if you screw up and the variable is currently holding a string and you try and divide 7 by a string, you're definitely going to get an error. Well, you might get an error. If you multiply 7 by a string, what you'll get is that string printing out 7 times. So it kind of infers what's the right thing to do with the variable depending on what type is currently inside of that variable, what data type. Um, there's a couple of rules about variables. The name of the variable must start with a letter. And it can only contain text letters and numbers and the underscore character. No dots allowed in Python variable names and no, no hyphen dashes. Hyphen dash is a minus sign, and Python will try and interpret it that way. A dot is an operator that has a lot of different functions depending on syntax, and it's not allowed in a variable name. No other mathematical symbols or weird gibberish from the keyboard. Letters and numbers, but it must start with a letter. A few Python variables start with an underscore, but those are mostly special variables that are used by the system, and we try and avoid them. You should try and avoid them. Um, variable names are case sensitive, so something named with a capital letter is different than that same thing named with a lowercase letter. A, lower, a capital letter anywhere inside will also create a different variable. So, you know, you could think of the, the letters, the, the capital letters and the small case letters as being completely separate alphabets. And you could use any of them, but each one of them is, is unique. Um, comments. I put comments right up here at the beginning of the lecture because comments are really important, especially for novice programmers. Comments are bits of text that you add into your code to explain what it does. You could have a comment at the beginning of your program. You should have a comment at the beginning of your program saying what the program is for, who wrote it, you, and maybe the date that you wrote it. Those things will be really helpful when you have a whole mess of different sh files with really short names sitting in a directory on your computer somewhere in a folder, and you try and remember what you know XML2 stands for. And then you open it up, and there's a nice friendly comment saying, this is a program to parse XML for Perl from GemBank, yada, yada. And it was written by me on this date for such and such an exercise or to solve a problem on my experiment um, you know, published on the cover of Nature. So that'll be good. Um, the comments are ignored by the computer, so you can write whatever you want. And you can sprinkle comments throughout the program. You could say, I'm assigning a variable here to my primer, or I'm this code calculates GC content, or whatever you want. You sprinkle it throughout the program any place that you think needs an explanation. And the person you're usually going to be explaining it to is yourself, unless you're a pretty good coder and you start to share your code with other people. Or you publish a uh, manuscript that makes use of some analysis that you've written into code, and now that code becomes part of the documentation for your paper, part of the supplemental data. And then other people will be downloading it and reading it. Python uses the hash symbol to mark a comment. Anything on a line after that hash symbol is ignored. Uh, use a lot of comments in your code for a good grade um, so others can understand it and so you can understand it yourself in the future. Okay, some examples. Uh, this is an example of a variable. A value is assigned to a variable by the equal sign. The value to the right of the equal sign is put into the variable name on the left of the equal sign. So you could think of that equal sign as a big swoopy arrow. And it always points to the left. So as a result of this, an equal sign anywhere else in code is not 
it's not used anywhere else in code because it's all reserved for this function of assigning a value to a variable. If we want to ask if two values are the same as each other, there's a special symbol, a double equal sign, that is used. That is actually the most common mistake, or the second most common mistake made by novice Python programmers, is using a single equal sign when you mean a double equal sign. So, um, you know, variable names, it's good to have descriptive variable names that, that make some sense. You know, naming a variable x is not nearly as good as naming a variable my DNA or gene length or dog text or something like that, where you have some chance of knowing what is in that variable as it marches down in your program and you do different things with it. Um, here's an example of a comment where I put that, spaces are part of a string, so this whole string is one. Uh, one data element that is inserted into this variable as a single string. Uh, counter 6, pi short, 3.14. Notice that integers don't have quotes around them. If you put quotes around them, it's no longer a number. Now it's some text which happens to use numerical symbols. Um, so don't make that mistake. Um, HBB human, quotes around that. This is a string that's wrapping on the screen but does not have carriage returns inside of the string itself. That'll happen pretty often. There are ways to have a string that does include carriage returns. We'll, we'll probably handle that at some point later. Um, this is jumping ahead, but this is a different kind of a variable inserted in, in this is a different kind of data type inserted into a variable, which is a list. And I'm going to get to that in a second. All right, strings first. You don't usually get to strings first in a programming class, but because this is bioinformatics, and as I described last lecture, text is of primary importance in communicating scientific data of all kinds. Yes, we have tables of numbers and mathematical values, but a lot of our important data is communicated as text. So strings are text, and they must always be in quotes. You can use single or double quotes, it contains spaces, and it can contain new line characters inside of the quotes. Biology data involves lots of strings, and a string is usually assigned to a variable. You don't usually um, write out a whole string more than once in your program, and more often you're going to feed a string into your program from some data file, you're going to you know, download a FASTA sequence as a data file, and you're going to set up a pointer to that file. Your program is going to read it and store it as a variable. So you never have to type out the string. And it also gives you the flexibility that it could read, that program could read any data, as long as you correctly point to the file that contains the data. So. Um, that's how we handle strings. There's a lot of strings, taxonomies, etc. Right, so here's a string that is the uh, GI description line for a GenBank file. Um, another concept in Python is a method. And this is actually, again, an object-oriented concept. Since a string is a very precisely defined data type. As soon as you define a piece of data as a string, you enable a bunch of pre-built tools that can now operate on that string because they know what they're dealing with. They're dealing with text. So um, the method can do something and transform the string. And methods in Python use a unusual syntax that you've probably not seen before, which I call the dot syntax. So the variable, my DNA, that's the name of the variable, and it's holding this string right now. And now I'm going to use a string method called count. And in order to count the string, I'm going to type my DNA dot count. And then the thing which the method is acting on, uh, not the thing, the, the parameter 
for the method. And the parameter may take from zero to many uh, parameters. The, the method has various parameters. The count, per, the count method requires some sort of parameter, which is a text letter. So in this case, it's going to count how many G's are inside of the string, which is currently in my DNA. And so the response, I'm, I'm trying to code it here. So the green is what uh, Python will give back to you if you interactively uh, type in these two commands. It'll say two, meaning my DNA contains two G's. If you were to change the string inside of my DNA and then run my DNA count G again, you would presumably get a different number of capital G letters in your my DNA. There's also a, a method called lower. And lower takes a string of characters. And if they are alphanumer alphabetic characters and not numbers, it makes them lowercase. If they're numbers, it ignores them. So it's a clever method. It knows a lot of things. It knows the difference between a capital and a lowercase letter. It knows about allowable string characters that have no lowercase, such as numbers and the underscore, and spaces, and a bunch of other things that are allowed to be in a string, but have no lowercase. So somebody went to some effort to write that method, and people liked it, and they built it into the Python code. And you can get a complete list of the methods that belong to the, ver the data type string um, from the Python help. And that will clue you into more methods. You can imagine that there's an upper method that corresponds to the lower. And there's a length method that tells you how long the string is in characters. And um, a lot of other methods. And they all come as a package as soon as you uh, well, actually, there's, they're, they're built into the core of Python, but they become available to you when you have a data that is of type string. You're allowed to use those methods. You can't use a string method on an integer. It wouldn't make sense. Um, another operator, and this is a little different than a method, and it uses a slightly different syntax. There's this plus operator. And you can add two strings together. And you can see for yourself what happens when you add the string cat to the string hat. Um, or you could assign the string cat to one variable and the string hat to another variable. And add those two variables and assign the product to a third variable. And now print the contents of that third variable. Um, Here's a little syntaxy thing that's super annoying. Um, there are different versions of Python. Python is currently in transition between version 2 and version 3. And the biggest difference in my observation is how it handles print. The default install, if you just click install from Anaconda, gives you Python version 2.7 point something, where you can use this command, print ch and it will print the value of the variable ch. Um, in Python version 3, you have to put little um, parentheses around the thing that you are printing because print is now a more carefully defined function. And functions need to have uh, parentheses in them. So Mostly, you'll, you'll download the default anaconda, and you can just print a variable by saying print. This one up here would also work without the uh, parentheses around it in Python 2. And now you can print cat in the hat this way. That would be fun, sort of. Um, print has a, yeah. A what? The single, the single quote and double there is no difference between single quote and double quote. Um, Python uses them interchangeably, but you have to use it consistently in one expression. You can't put a single quote at one end and a double quote at the other end. 
When Python puts uh, text on the screen in quotes, it usually gives you single quotes. Um, it looks a little cleaner and more computery when I type, so sometimes I use the single, sometimes I don't remember. It's not required to be consistent throughout your program, only within one expression. Yeah? Would you recommend At this moment, yes. Um, there is more software in the universe that has been written in version 2, and there is uh, backwards compatibility issues. If you're running a program written in 2 and you're running it in 3, you may encounter a glitch. Um, I, strangely enough, I haven't seen glitches the other way around, running a program in 3 with 2, but you could definitely get a glitch that way too. Some, you call some function that's built in in 3 and not available in 2. So it's helpful to know what version of Python a given program is written in. That is not built in to the program, but it might be hopefully written in a comment line at the start of the program. So that's a little glitchy thing that they really didn't think through. So be it. It's, it's written by humans and it has its strengths and weaknesses. Um, you can print an integer. You can say print 5 and it'll print the 5. But operations like concatenation are string methods. And so if you want to print 5 dogs as a, an element there and you have a string that contains dogs and you want to say 5 dogs, you have to convert the number into a string inside of the print command. So very, very commonly in Python, you'll see this syntax where one function sits inside of another. So if A is 5 and you try and print A plus C, you'll get an error because you've used a concatenation command on an integer and a string. And there is no built-in way to concatenate an integer with a string. But if you first convert the contents of A into a string, now instead of having the numerical value 5, now you have a text character 5 in quotes. And then you can concatenate that with other strings. And in this case, you're adding some free text, which did not exist in a variable, concatenating it with the string of uh, whatever value is in A numerically concatenating an empty space, and then you're concatenating the value of C, and then you're adding uh, the letter S with no space. So this is stuff for you to try out. So you know, having nicely formatted output is a feature of a decently written program, as opposed to just spewing a number on the screen. It, it, it says what that number is. You know, E value is, and then it gives you the number. So this is how you build a nicely formatted output. Or this is one way to build a nicely formatted output. Yeah? Uh, what about the plus sign? Uh, like I see that sometimes it's inside the quote, sometimes it's outside, and you repeat it at the end. It's, the it's not inside the quotes, actually. The plus sign, if it was in the quotes, would actually literally print a plus on the screen. So you have to sort of count your quotes. This is one set of quotes. This empty, empty thing here is another set of quotes. STRA doesn't need quotes because that's a function. This is another empty space inside of quotes. And this is the letter S inside of quotes. So the plus sign can be inside of the parenthesis, which is kind of like a nested function. But it is not inside of the quotes, or you literally will print a plus sign as part of your output instead of doing the concatenation, which is what we're trying to illustrate here. OK, there's some more methods. I already mentioned upper and lower. They return a value that changes the case of your string. You usually need to put this value into the variable. Otherwise, the original string will be unchanged. So if you print lower of a variable, and that variable contains a string, it will in fact print the lower case on the screen, but it won't change the value in the variable. That variable will still contain letters that some of which are in uppercase. 
So that's a feature of all these methods. If you want to save the result of the method, you have to intentionally write that value back into a variable. You could write it into a new variable and define that new variable name right then and there. Or you could change the, you could write it back into the original variable. That's one of the nice things about that big loopy uh, arrow in the equal sign. It does all the work on the right side of the equal sign, changes whatever values need to be changed. And when it's done, it writes that value to whatever is on the left side of the equal sign. So you can change what's inside a variable in the same expression and write that right back into the same variable. Now you have a lowercase string in that variable. Hope that makes sense. So my DNA, my DNA uh, of this string lower will print that. But if you look at what's in my DNA, it still hasn't changed. Um, okay. But if you had said my DNA, my DNA equals my DNA dot lower, then you would change what was in my DNA. So again, try that. Len is a function that gives the length of a string. Pretty nice, pretty simple. A lot of these functions, if you just type the function, you get the result spewed on the screen. But if you want to capture that result, you have to assign it to a variable with an equal sign, which is usually what you would do if you were writing a permanent program as opposed to just interacting with Python back and forth on the screen. So I, I should get into that, but I didn't want to d dive into that right this second. OK, find is another really handy string method. Note that it only works for exact matches. You can't do um, fuzzy matches, regular expressions with the find command. But if you wanted to find the exact string GC in my DNA, it would find it. Ah, and here's the funny thing about find. It doesn't tell you how many times it's there. It tells you where it is in the string. And I'll get to string locations very soon. So it returns the position index of the first occurrence of the search string in the target. Find is also not iterative. It stops after it finds it one time. So it's, it's, not, um, it's not a motif finder yet. It's, it's just a very, very simple tool. Um, if you have find, do you have replace? Yes. Replace finds and replaces letters in a string. Um, I've only ever used this for single letters, and it does, in fact, find all the instances of a single letter and replace them with the second letter. This is, I think, the first time I've shown you a function that takes more than one input parameter. And you'll notice this little comma here. So it takes, it requires two input parameters, replace. Obviously, you need to be looking for something and replacing it with something else. And so replace requires two input parameters separated by a comma. Um, for functions that take more than two parameters, more commas. Some functions have a variable number of parameters. You can give it one or two or three or four, and it has a default value for the additional per optional parameters. Usually the required ones come first. Always the required ones come first, then the optional ones come later. And they're always separated with commas. And they're always inside of the parentheses. So that's how functions work. So replaces, yeah, it's a method. And it takes the parameters. Some of these methods, I should point out, like lower, it has these parentheses there, but nothing inside of them, which is sort of a weirdness of Python. And what it's saying is basically this function has no required parameters, and we're not giving it any optional parameters. We're just doing the, the replacement of upper string, uppercase with lowercase characters. So every one of these dot method functions has a parenthesis after it. Sometimes the parentheses are empty if you don't have any required parameters. And there may be optional parameters that could go in here, and you could learn that by studying the help 
for that function. OK, now we're on to lists. I showed a list before. List is a more complex varia variable type. And yeah? I would have to play with that. I'm sure if I go and try and do it off the top of my head, I will get it wrong. There's an additional complication there where sometimes if you do a bunch of replacements, you'll end up replacing something later that got swapped in before. So you have to be a little bit careful with it. Certainly, you could first replace Ts with As and then Gs with Cs in two separate commands. but. I think so, but I would have to think about it. I, I, I'm not going to give you the syntax off the top of my head because I will certainly get it wrong. I, I tend to get these things wrong until I get them right. It takes me a little bit, but that's fine. <laughs> certainly, we could get that answered for you in five minutes. Pam probably knows it off the top of her head. Well, we'll get to it later. It's, it's not, I mean, if, how, how do you replace two characters rather than one everywhere in the string? Replace two characters rather than one everywhere in the string, all in one command. That's what we're talking about, dot replace, yeah. yeah. But if you type like T, T is being replaced by X, but if you type TA, it would only look for TA together. It won't replace every T and every A. Oh, you can just like change the replaces. I mean, there might be a better way. There is definitely a better way because if you replace T with A and then you replace you know, G with C, and then you replace the A's with something else, you overwrite the A's that previously got replaced by T, or you know what I mean? So it's not the way you would typically do a more complex replacement. But yeah, you could, you could chain them one after another. I don't know how to do it in just one command. And it's just like not done that way. So we'll skip it for now. Yeah, you can do one command with regular expression. Yes, yes, with a regular expression, but that's like way more complex than the 14th slide. <laughs> so we'll, we'll get to regular expressions a little bit later, which is like in the motif section, right? Because regular expressions are super powerful in, in things like protein motifs. All right, let's talk about lists because that's the, the next level up in data complexity. And, and we'll talk about this a lot that a given new data type is now being defined for you and it's built out of less complex data types, it, it grows iteratively in complexity. So a list is a series of individual data items separated by commas. So previously we only talked about a variable holding one data item, one value. Now the value is actually a list of many things. And one of the interesting properties of Python is that Python lists can have anything you want in them, including both numbers, text, other variables, and other lists. All of those things are allowable entries in a list. And you can mix and match. So you can have fish hat box 17 and true, a Boolean, all in the same list. Um, lists are really, really common in Python. It's extremely frequently used uh, data type. In addition, as I have illustrated here, you typically assign a list to a variable. So a variable can hold an individual piece of data. It can also hold a list. As I said before, a variable is a box and you can put whatever you want into it. So you could put a list into your variable instead of a single data element. And then the variable refers to the list. Nice and simple. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those aren't strings, so those are things. Okay. Okay. Yes, those are presumably other variables because they're not in quotes. If I had just made them numbers, one, two, three, four, five, then you would know that they were integers. So uh, if you haven't assigned A, B, C, and D, it would give you an error. Okay. 
yeah, I, I should have put them in quotes. That would have looked more uglier, but it would have been more valid. Here I have, in the second list, I have these strings, right? So these are variables, these are strings, these are strings and numbers mixed together, all being assigned to different variables. The, different, the lists are being assigned to different variables. Okay, the elements in a list are ordered. They can be accessed by their in index number in the list. However, super important in bold and in red, Python starts counting list elements at zero. This is a computer science-y thing that it inherits from older languages. And you'll find it really annoying because we don't usually think about counting where the starting at zero, right? Even our language says the first element, which you know we usually think of as one. Nope, Python says the first element in your list is the zeroth element. And that's the index that you would refer to that element by. So when you say my list index one, you don't get G, you get A. It's the zero, one, two, three elements in that list. Another thing that I should have said is that lists are defined by square brackets. That's a, a key thing. And when you uh, reference an index number for a list, you also use square brackets to, to point to a specific element of that list. So my list one is A, A is a string, so it prints with quotes. My list one, two, three, here's another very peculiar thing about Python that inherits from computer science, older languages, is a range of values includes the first value, but not the last value. So my list one to three will just give you these two guys. And you can try this and hopefully it works for you too. Um, when you just include the colon and you leave out the first value, it counts from the beginning of the list. And if you just include a number and the colon and no second value, it counts all the way to the end of the list. If you just put the colon, it gives you the whole list, which is sort of pointless because you didn't have to put the bracket and the colon in the first place. You could have just print out the list by name and it would give you the whole list. But I could see a situation where that might come in, might happen inside of a program where Sometimes you need the beginning of the list, sometimes you need the end, sometimes you need the whole thing, and just the column will give you the whole list. Um, a negative index counts backwards from the end of the list, and that can be very handy as well. So, mm, yeah. Okay, we talked about methods that operate on strings. Well, there are methods that operate on lists, and they're somewhat different, and you can't necessarily use a list method on a string or a string method on a list. Again, this is part of the object-oriented feature that a given data type has certain properties, and some of those properties are defined uh, as methods. So, um, Oh, you can replace a given element of a list just by a definition statement. So if I create a list like this one, four elements to it, and then I, I, I use this equal sign to add the element x back into the list, you get the one element of the list now being x instead of a. So now you print the list and first element is replaced relatively straightforward yeah and it doesn't have to be the same type, right? no lists can have different types in it so just like you can swap out what's in a variable you can swap out what's in a list all right there's a method uh, count that has a, a, a list syntax just like the string count does and so you can say my list count G's and it'll look to see how many of the string G are present in your list so this list has a G in it so it gives you a one list append is a very commonly used method and this 
brings up an important feature of lists. Not only can you change what's in them, but you can grow them. So as you append things to a list, it goes on to the end and the list gets longer. Um, this is very commonly done inside of a loop. So while you're running a loop, you collecting data and you're writing your output by appending it onto the end of a list each time you go around the loop. It's a very, very simple and commonly used way of collecting data. So my list append T puts T on the end of the list. Okay, now we're going to talk about slicing. So we have to get back to those index numbers. Strings can be treated like a list of letters. So there's actually a certain amount of interoperability between strings and lists. So this is a list of individual letters and they have, am I doing that or is that another fire drill? Fire drill. It's a, your attention, your attention. We're conducting a test of the fire alarm system. Please disregard all alarms. Your attention, your attention. We're conducting a test of the fire alarm system. Please disregard all alarms. Thanks. Nice. <laughs> okay, so the string. The string. <laughs> Any more? Okay. The string has positions. They start at zero. So my DNA a square bracket one gives you the one position, which is this guy here, which is a T. My DNA one to four is a slice of this string that starts at one up to and not including four. So then you get TGC. Okay. You can split a string into a list because sometimes you need to do operations that can only be done on a list and can't be done on a string. And the split method does this. By default, it splits on white space. So it typically would take a sentence and split it into a list of words and you would lose the white space between them. But any character can be specified in the parenthesis to be used as a delimiter. So this is nice for tab delimited data or comma delimited values that might be exported from some sort of spreadsheet software or statistical software. And you could just take each line and do a split on that line and um, it's handy. Right, so this is a, a list of species, species name splits, and so now you have um, names that have been split. And so you're taking names one and species two and doing that. So names is actually one long string, and one of that string is actually the letter E, but species is a list of names, and species two gives you the third one after you split them on the comma, so it gives you that. Again, try this. If you don't have it running now, try it you know, tonight or tomorrow, whatever. This is simple stuff, but it really, you learn it by typing it, not by listening. All right, the list function splits a string into a list of characters, as opposed to splitting it into a list of words. Now you get each character as a element in the string, and now the space becomes a character as well. Um, I could see using that occasionally, not super often. Join turns a list of strings into a single string. It's the kind of the reverse of the list. So you have these things, and it joins them back together. Actually, no, it's the, it's the reverse of split. Split join, right? Because you can optionally insert a spacer between each of the elements. So if you spacer join my list and spacer is a colon, now you get a list that looks like a string that looks like this, that has inserted this element between each of the elements in the list. Um, so you get join my list with this spacer and you get that. Okay. This was from Pam's tutorial. So this is a bunch of exercises for you to try yourself, not right this second, but uh, this, will give, this will probably give you quite a bit of experience with slicing strings, which is a super handy thing that you'll end up doing a lot because we do a lot of work with strings. Okay, I'm winding down. Math. Python can do math. It can act like a calculator. So you can just type these things interactively into the, the interactive Python session, 2 plus 2, hit return, it'll give you back 4, most likely. Um, 
division is that mar is the slash there. Um, asterisk is a multiplication symbol. Double asterisk is a power symbol. You know, six to the, the second power exponentiation. Um, Python does not activate all of its built-in functions when you start it up. You use the import command to add modules. So even the Python that you download, the very base Python that you download, actually contains a bunch of modules that are not currently active. And you can call them up by just typing import and then the name of the module. So there's a bunch of math functions that are available. So oh, apparently they do that either every day or every hour because we've been in here twice and they've done it twice, right? <laughs> okay, so import math brings in a bunch of sort of higher level functions in math, you know, beyond addition and subtraction. So, so So the square root function, SQRT, is part of the math package. So even though you've imported math, you still type math.square root. And then the, the parentheses and what you put inside the parentheses is the thing that will have its square root taken. So fairly straightforward. So you import math, math square root 36, and it gives you 6.0. Um, not 6 because this is a... Um, well, I forgot the name for it, but it's a kind of function that deals with, with rational numbers rather than just integers. Um, almost done here. Some of the really simple things that are achieved with a GUI like Mac OS or Windows are ridiculously hard to accomplish in Python. They, for example, navigating what around the directory structure uses a module called OS. And so you have to import OS and then type OS get current working directory parentheses to figure out where Python is currently located in your file system. In other words, where it will be reading and writing its files, which is something you'll obviously need to do in order to read in data, which we're going to get to very shortly. So you'll need to have OS, you'll need to type git current working directory, you'll need to type a list of what files are in the current working directory, which is OS list dir quote dot. Um, yeah, so it's unreasonably difficult, but once you know how to do it. Um, because you're not necessarily always going to get your files from exactly the same directory. And you sometimes need to know what's in your directory. In any case, this is how you do it. And obviously, key, experienced Python programmers never do this because it's not that simple. Um, this is how you would change a directory. So if you needed to read a few files here and then a few files there in different subdirectories, you would use this uh, OS change directory command. OK, well, very close to done now. Um, we're going to talk very briefly about arrays, mostly because we're going to, you're going to get into this later on in the course, and I want to introduce it as a simple concept and then build on it. So an array is like a list, but it contains only numbers, and they have dimensions. Um, NumPy, NumPy is a Python module that enables array operations in much the way that that enables array operations. Here is a simple one-dimensional array of integers, which is like a list. Import numpy as np. This makes it a little shorter. x equals np array. And then these 
list of integers and we're defining them as integers. And then if you type X, it'll say it's an array that contains this. Um, there's a really nice lecture introduction to NumPy arrays in the Software Carpentry website. I made a link here. Um, a two-dimensional two array, which is when things sort of start to get more interesting, is a list of lists. A two-dimensional array is a list of lists, but each row must have the same number of elements. Right, I also mentioned that arrays must contain only numbers. So now we're not in the realm of lists where we can have all kinds of mixed things. Because you're going to do matrix math operations on a two-dimensional array, and therefore the software assumes and requires that you have numerical elements inside your array. Um, Note that we have nested square brackets when we output the array. Um, NumPy has no problem with more dimensions. You could have a list of list of list of lists, but it's relatively awkward to start printing that out on the screen, so I'm going to leave it to your imagination. Um, matrices are two-dimensional arrays. NumPy has a nice linear algebra methods for operations on matrices. These require that the two matrices, mostly they require that the two matrices are the same size. And things like matrix subtraction, multiplication, dot product, and cross product. So I'm not going to give examples of that. I'm just going to hint that those things exist, and, and you will be getting to them a little bit later. But circling back around to you getting started installing Python for the first time and doing these get acquainted operations, I assign you, recommend that you start now either installing the Anaconda Python or going to Rosalind Python Village and start working through the first couple of problems. Initially, those who don't have Python installed and have trouble with it, you know, put your hand up and our, our teaching assistants will come around and help you. And once all those initial problems are dealt with, those who are having trouble with the problem one and two and Rosalind can uh, ask for some help. And so we've got 45 minutes or maybe a little more here before we get kicked out. And then you can hike over to Translational Research Building where we have a conference room until after five. So everybody should be able to get, you know, say the first three of these six problems done um, by five o'clock today. And that's what we covered and we're done for now. All right, so help people. Is that a question or help me? Help. Okay, help them. <laughs> we have a small army of helpers here. <laughs> of yes it's out there who has my sign-in sheet it went around 